Let's take a look now at how meiosis is connected to Mendel's principles. Mendel proposed two main principles. The first is the principle of segregation. This principle states that for each gene that a parent has, they have two copies of the, or two versions of that gene, the offspring will only inherit one of those versions. As diploid organisms, we have two versions of every gene that we have, and only one of those versions will get passed on to our offspring. So let's say a parent that is heterozygous for gene A has a dominant version of gene A and a recessive version of gene A. Their offspring will only inherit either the dominant allele or the recessive allele, but the offspring will not inherit both alleles. Of the two alleles that the parent has, they are equally as likely to get either one of the versions. So you have 50% chance of getting the recessive allele or the dominant allele if the parent is heterozygous. The other principle that Mendel proposed is the principle of independent assortment. This principle is only visible when we're looking at two or more genes at the same time. So this is when we're doing the hybrid crosses, we're looking at two different genes or more than that. And in this case, the principle of independent assortment says the alleles for two or more genes get sorted into gametes independently of one another. So in other words, the allele a gamete receives for one gene does not influence the allele received for the other gene. So let's look at what do we mean by that. So let's say a parent is heterozygous for gene A and heterozygous for gene B. So that is they have a dominant and a recessive allele for gene A and a dominant and a recessive allele for gene B. Their offspring, because of the principle of segregation, will only get one version of gene A and will only get one version of gene B from this parent. And they are equally as likely to get either the dominant version or the recessive version for gene A or the dominant version or the recessive allele for gene B. But how they combine, this is what the principle of independent assortment says, is that inheriting the dominant allele for gene A with the dominant allele for B is just as likely as getting the dominant allele for A with the recessive for B or the recessive allele for A and the dominant allele for B as getting just both recessive alleles. So the saying, any of these combinations is equally as likely. So whether you get the dominant allele for gene A or the recessive for gene A does not determine which allele you will inherit for gene B. So the inheritance of gene A does not affect the inheritance for gene B. What does that mean when we are applying the concepts of genetics? When we're trying to predict the outcome of a cross, we use Punnett squares. And in those Punnett squares, we have one side belongs to one parent, the other side belongs to the other parent. And we put, if, the, if both parents are heterozygous, we put one version of one allele in one of the boxes and the other in the other box. If they're heterozygous, the dominant allele goes in the first box and the recessive allele goes in the other box. The order doesn't really matter, but this is the convention, dominant alleles go first. If they're, hetero, they're homozygous, sorry, both boxes will have the same version because they only have the same uh, type of allele. If they're both dominant alleles or both recessive alleles. And the same thing for the other parent. We put each of the alleles in that parent on each of the boxes. So we only put one allele on each box. So why do we put only one allele on each box? And this is because of the principle of segregation. Mendel says of the two alleles that a parent has, so this parent has dominant and recessive alleles, only one of those will get passed on to the offspring. And the same thing for the second parent. They're heterozygous, they have dominant and recessive allele, but only one of those will be passed on to the offspring. And if they were homozygous, still they would only pass one of their alleles to the offspring. Even though we are diploid, in meiosis, the gametes we produce are haploid and only have one version of each of the alleles. Now let's look at a dihybrid cross. When we are analyzing the probabilities of gametes that a parent can produce, here we're looking at a heterozygous plant that is heterozygous for the gene for seed color and seed shape. So we're looking at two different traits. We're looking whether the seed is round. So here we have round seeds or wrinkle or wrinkle seeds. And this, this parent is heterozygous for that gene. So it's heterozygous for R. We're going to call R the, the gene for seed shape. 
And we're also looking at another trait that is seed color. And this plant is also heterozygous for seed colors. Yellow is dominant to green seeds, so the parent has yellow seeds, but it is heterozygous. Uh, the seeds can either be yellow or green. And we're assuming that when this parent produces gametes, it's equally as likely to produce gametes that have the yellow and round seed genes with gametes that have the round and green seeds or gametes that have wrinkle and yellow seeds and gametes that have wrinkle and green seeds. And they're saying any of those combinations in the gametes are equally as likely. So what of, which one of Mendel's principle are we following here? Why are we attributing equal probabilities to all of these gamete types? And this is the principle of independent assortment because an independent assortment is saying whether you get the allele for round or wrinkle doesn't determine which allele you will get for seed color. So the inheritance of seed shape doesn't affect the inheritance of seed color. So you're equally as likely to get round and yellow as you are to get round and green for a parent that is heterozygous for both traits. So now let's combine those two. When we're looking at a dihybrid cross, we put all those combinations of gametes in each of these boxes. So let's say here we have a cross of two heterozygous plants and we're looking at two traits. We're looking at two different genes. We're looking at seed shape and seed color again. And both parents are heterozygous for both, both of those traits. And we put in each of these boxes the possible combinations of, of alleles that we can have. So we have four different combinations. We can either have the dominant allele for seed shape or the recessive allele for seed shape and then the dominant allele for seed shape can go with the dominant allele for seed color or the recessive allele for seed color and the same thing for wrinkle seeds they can go with the dominant allele for yellow color or the recessive allele which is green color so when we're putting each of these combinations in in each of these boxes which of Mendel's principles are we following well, we're following both of these principles. We're prin following the principle of segregation because of the R gene, we're only using one allele on each box. So you either have the big R or the little r on each of the boxes. So that is the principle of segregation. And the principle of independent assortment because we're given equal chances that the big R will go with big Y as it will big R with little y. The same thing for little r. We're saying equal chances that little r will go with big Y as little r will go with little y. And that's why we're giving them each their own box because each box in this Punnett square has equal weight. So keep in mind when we're looking at meiosis, meiosis is happening in the parents independently. So students tend to think that meiosis is the reason why they are a mix of mom and dad. It's, meiosis is not the reason why we are a mix of mom and dad. Meiosis is the reason why from our mom we get we got a mix from her mom and her dad's genes and from our dad we got a mix of his mom and his dad genes. So keep in mind that meiosis is happening in the gonads of each parent separately in the testes of the father and in the ovaries in the mother and this is happening way before they even thought about having children. The act of meiosis is just happening in your own chromosomes, mixing your own chromosomes that you receive from your mom and your dad in, through the process of fertilization. So meiosis is how mom and dad produce their own gametes. So the mom produces eggs and the dad produces sperm. And that, those gametes have now a combination of the dad's genes. So the sperm has a combination of the dad's genes, which are the genes he got from his parents. And the egg has a combination of the genes in the mom, which are the chromosomes she got from her parents. And then those two gametes will combine and will fuse their nuclei, which is called karyogamy in fertilization. And that's how you will form the first cell of the baby that now has both sets of chromosomes in the nucleus. However, those chromosomes are not mixing with each other. So they're, they're both present in the nucleus, but it's not like... It, meiosis is not happening there. Meiosis won't happen until that baby grows, if it's a male, and start producing sperm of his own. If it's a girl, then as soon as the ovaries start forming, the meiosis will get started. So meiosis 
only happens to produce gametes and it's so that the gametes have a mix of the parents' parents. So that is how the baby will get a mix of its maternal grandparents in the egg when the egg was produced by meiosis and its paternal grandparents when, when the sperm that was produced by meiosis in the dad. Now let's see which steps in meiosis are responsible for introducing genetic variation. And the one you're most familiar with is likely crossing over. So crossing over happens in prophase one of meiosis, meiosis one, and the homologous chromosomes here for the first time ever come together and swap pieces of DNA. So now the chromosomes that you inherit from your mom and the chromosomes you inherit from your dad swap pieces so they're no longer as you inherit them. Now they have pieces of maternal and paternal sections. This creates chromosomes uh, that are new, that are unique. And since crossing over can happen in multiple places and where it actually happens, every time you produce gametes, crossing over will happen in different places. So you will have a different combination of maternal and paternal sections. The other unique thing that happens in meiosis, since the homologous chromosomes are now paired up, when metaphase one comes, they align on the metaphase plate and you can have the maternal version of one chromosome facing one side and the paternal facing the other side. And for this other chromosome, you can have the same or a different setup. And if you have multiple chromosomes, like in our case, in humans, we have 23 pairs, you will have 23 pairs of these chromosomes line up and they can be facing either the maternal side facing one way or the paternal side and each combination will give you a different set of alleles in the cells that will result. Another unique event that happens in meiosis is the separation of the homologous chromosomes. Here is where the cells become haploid because we used to have two sets of chromosomes so for each for chromosome one we had a maternal or a paternal version but now that those versions separate and they go into separate cells, now we have cells that are haploid. And this is important because this reduction in the number of chromosomes allows for when fertilization happens and the chromosomes now come together from the mom and the, and the dad, the number of chromosomes doesn't increase with every generation, but it stays constant. Another event that happens in meiosis is the random orientation of the recombinant chromatids. The reason why it is important is because now these chromatids are recombinant. They're no longer identical as they were at the beginning of, of meiosis, at the beginning of prophase one. They used to be identical because they were the result of DNA replication. But since crossing over happened in prophase one and those chromatids swap pieces with the homologous chromosome, now they're no longer identical. So when they separate here in in metaphase 2, you also have multiple ways in which those chromatids can align and that can give you multiple probabilities of gene combinations. And finally, the separation of the chromatids at the end of meiosis 2 resulting in complete haploid cells. In mitosis, you had, we also had separation of the sister chromatids, but since the sister chromatids in mitosis were identical, that didn't result in any variation. Now let's look at how meiosis is related to the principle of segregation that Mendel observed. Again, the principle of segregation is of the two versions of the alleles that you have, of the two alleles that you have, only one of those alleles will be passed on to the offspring. So why does that happen? Well, the reason it happens is because we have two versions of the alleles because we have two sets of chromosomes. Each set of chromosomes has a version of every gene in the genome. So we have a paternal version and a maternal version for every gene. And since meiosis goes from a diploid cell into haploid cells, it is reducing how many versions we have. So we go from having two versions to gametes that only have one version. So that's how only one version of the alleles get passed on to the offspring. And this starts because the homologs separate at the end of meiosis 1. So here is where the cell goes haploid. When we start with this cell and we have two sets of chromosomes, those chromosomes then replicate in DNA replication and when they replicate we still have two sets of chromosomes but now we have sister chromatids so you really have four segments of DNA that have information for that gene. Here, when the homologs separate, this cell still has chromatids. Each chromosome still has two chromatids, so you still have two versions, although they might be identical versions, as they might be 
the result of DNA replication, or there might be different versions if the, if the chromatids are recombinant in that point. But you still have two segments of DNA with information for that trait. So you need the second round of division that would separate the chromatids so that now you only have one segment of DNA that has information for that trait. So let's say a gene that is on this long chromosome, at the end of meiosis, you only have one version of the long chromosome, so you only have one version of the, gene that are, of the genes that are located in that chromosome. Since meiosis results in only one set of chromosomes, for all the genes in the genome, now you only have one version in these haploid cells. And how does meiosis contribute to independent assortment? Independent assortment is when we're looking at two different genes, and we're looking at what alleles for those genes are inherited. And say, the alleles that you get for one gene do not determine the alleles you get for the other gene. If those genes are located in different chromosomes, let's say you have the allele for having a widow speak is on the, on the maternal side, and it's on chromosome 1, and the allele for tasting PTC or, let's say, disliking broccoli is on chromosome 2, the random orientation of the homologous chromosomes during metaphase 1 means that you can get any of the alleles that are on chromosome 2 with any of the alleles that are on chromosome 1. And since this random orientation can happen in different ways for every time you do meiosis, for every time you produce a new set of gametes, then gametes will have any possible combination between whether you have widow speak or no widow speak and whether you can taste broccoli or not taste broccoli. Since the chromatids have uh, exchanged DNA during crossing over, their orientation in metaphase 2 would also increase the variation, creating multiple combinations of genes that are on the different chromosomes. And for genes that are on the same chromosome, then crossing over is what it would increase the chances that genes that are on the same chromosome can also assort independently if they're distantly located and uh, there are higher chances that crossing over will happen between them. So to summarize, there are multiple steps in meiosis that are unique and that lead to genetic variation.